Let's begin. Anybody who enters, please pick your seat. A few words about myself and then we would just begin. I'm a lecturer at the Academic College of Tel Aviv Yafo and Tel Aviv University. This year I'm visiting at uh, Stony Brook University in New York. I'm a developer advocate at Incredibuild and co-organizer of the Core CPP conference and meetup group. Uh, the Core CPP conference is in Tel Aviv and you just missed it. Or you were there. I don't know, it uh, happened last week. Um, a few words about Incredibuild. Being the dev advocate at Incredibuild, I should have a slide about that. So this is my marketing pitch. It would be very fast. If you are suffering from slow builds uh, or slow CI pipeline, which includes testing, which includes static code analysis, it is not just a waste of time. It actually affects and hurts your entire dev cycle and productivity. We are out there. We have a booth. Come and speak with us, and let's see how we can accelerate your CI pipeline. That's my pitch on Incredible. So we are here in order to discuss the basics of unit testing in C++ and encourage you to invest in proper testing. Now, this is a back to basics talk, which means that we would be on the basic stuff. Anybody here who already do um, testing might see some insights, might see some nice stuff, but you know, it would be the basics. Um, another thing that I want to uh, raise is feel free to ask. Uh, no need during the talk to come to the microphones. You can, if you want, you can just shout your question. I would try to hear it. I would repeat it for the video and then we can discuss. We would see some code. So it's quite natural that there are questions on code. If there is a question, don't be shy, don't hesitate. And at the end, if we would have time, you can go, go to the mics and, and add additional questions. So uh, let's start with testing levels. Uh, we are going to talk about unit tests. And unit tests are the tests for a single unit, a function, a class, and isolated as much as possible. And the idea is that once we check something which is isolated, it is much easier to find the bugs earlier before the entire system is ready or uh, without having any other noise from other parts of the system. But there are also other tests like component tests that try to test an entire component, integration tests that test several components together, and of course, at the end, system tests. And we should have all of them. But we are going to focus on unit tests in this talk. And I would say that even if you have good system tests, neglecting new unit testing is not a good thing because you pay for that in late discovery of bugs and much harder analysis of what actually happened there. So we want to find the bugs earlier in the process while they are still fresh on, on our desktop, and we want to be more efficient and effective. So unit tests are testing individual units of behavior, uh, the sm smallest possible unit, and you can write unit tests before you write the code, which is called TDD, test-driven development, or after you write the code, or while you write the code, the motivation for unit testing goes with this testing pyramid, which says that as you go up, uh, things would be slower. The tests them, them, themselves would take more time. It, it would be harder to write the test. Um, it would be harder to maintain the test. Um, more noise, they are less stable, and it is more costly. So having good coverage of our software at the lower level is, of course, something valuable. If you test code early, it is easier to fix while it is fresh in memory with uh, the one who wrote it. Uh, it doesn't affect the other teams. So it is not a bug that, oh, who did this bug? It's not me, it's the other team. No, it's that team. Uh, you get it while you write it. It is easier to analyze. 
less complexities and earlier in the process. And you get automatic regression, which is very important. You have a new feature. Okay, you can easily check that it didn't break anything, which you won't get if you're relying on a system test. You would have it only at the end. Others can touch the code with much less fear, which is also important. In many cases, you need to do something in the code and you are frightened. You, you, you just, you, 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 you say, I, I don't know what to do here because I might break something. And if you have good unit tests, you say, okay, I think that I know what I have to do. I can do that. And then I can check that nothing is being broken. It allows easier refactoring even for old production code. So refactoring goes quite tightly with having good unit testing. I mean, if you don't have good unit testing, how could you do refactoring knowing that you actually didn't break anything? Um, it, encourage, it encourages also clear API. If you need to write unit tests, you need the ability to call your API with an expected result. So, so you need expected results. You, you need to define the API. And in some cases, the, the difficulty to have good unit tests starts with the problem of not having a stable or defined API. So if you aim for a good unit test, you also earn the good API that you would have, the stable, the defined API. And, and TDD assists in that as well. Uh, code is always tested, you have higher confidence, we know when the code breaks, and code is better at the end because we are much less afraid of touching the code, and if there is a need to refactor something, we just do that. And also the test in a way documents the usage of the API. So if, if somebody wants to see, to check how you are supposed to use some kind of API, in many cases the starting point would be the tests. A few words about TDD, test-driven development, write the test first, review the test with the team, product, system engineer, so while you are reviewing the test, before even you wrote the first line of code, you can decide with your colleagues if you got the requirements correctly. I mean, should it work like that? And if the answer is no, 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 it's not the API that we decided, then you catch it up front before you write any line of code. Make the test compile but fail. A failing test is a good thing. Okay, we need now the code to work so the test would succeed, would pass. And then work on the feature implementation so the test would pass. And once the test passes, you know, I did that. It's quite Boolean. It's either it works or not. The pros are a better understanding of the feature and the API by creating the test you understand, as a user, in a way, how the feature should work. Actual control over the implementation progress. In many cases, there is a question of what is the percentage of your progress? And, well, I wrote uh, alpha function, so 50%. I wrote half the class, 50%. You cannot actually measure that. But you can measure how many tests actually pass. So you say, okay, we have uh, for this iteration uh, 20 tests and 12 passes. Okay, it says something. It is still quite hard to understand exactly how much time we still need or, or would be, we be on time, but it says something. Uh, make sure it, uh, uh, we test. When you do TDD, test-driven development, you know that you are testing because you started with the test and you do not keep the test to the last moment where you would not have time. In many cases, this is what, this what happens. There is a con also. In some cases, you would end up the iteration with, oh, I succeeded to have 100% of my test, but only 50% of my feature, which is not what you aim for. So how should you mitigate that? You should manage your time. Well, we always need to. Um, whether you are doing TDD or not, at the end, we do want to finish each iteration with the feature and the tests that actually show us that the feature works. 
Good unit tests should be maintainable, readable, and trustworthy. Maintainable means that if there is a need to change the test, it should not be too hard. And there might be a need to change the test because it might be that the requirements changed, okay? And it might be that um, we found a bug. Maybe the bug is in the test. It, it happens, so the test should be maintainable. It should be readable because when we have a bug, when, we, when the test fails, we don't want to get into the test and invest too much time in understanding what is going on there. It should be quite easy to understand. And it must be trustworthy in a way that if it fails, it actually shows a problem. And if it passes, it actually says that the thing that it tests actually works. I see there is a, on, an online question there. Yes, um, is t going back to TDD, is TDD appropriate during early architectural design or is it a waste of time considering that the whole API is too fluid? So the, the question, I, I repeat it just for myself, it is in the recording already, but uh, is TDD relevant at the early stages of architectural design where the API might change? And well, uh, it sounds like a question that takes us to a waterfall approach, I would say. I mean, when you actually come to implement a certain API in um, agile approach, the API that you are coming to implement, you should know what you are going to do. So I would say that in that certain iteration, the API should be stable. And if you feel that it would change a lot, it might be that you are not planning your development process correctly. But it is a good question. I mean, I would not recommend TDD always. Of course, as um, things are more stable, TDD is more relevant and vice versa. So we uh, talked about trustworthy. Um, it is crucial. If in some cases, I, I guess that you know that, uh, a certain test fails and everybody ignores that because, oh, this, this test, yeah, in, in some cases it fails, it's okay. So I would say just drop this test. Because if the test fails occasionally, but doesn't say anything, or you just ignore that because you feel, oh, it's because of the database is down, unit tests should not rely on database being up. But you should not rely on something that the test may fail and it is still okay. If it fails, it's a bug that you should analyze. And this is trustworthy for both sides. If it passes, it's okay. If not, it's a bug in your code. Uh, good unit test, um, you do not want to debug the test. So, so the test should be, uh, as we said, readable. Uh, and by the way, in, in unit tests, I can tell you that I do something that in some other cases in real code, in production code, I tend to um, not to do. I use some copy paste in some cases, some more than in regular code, because eventually if I have a very good abstraction and functions, and the whole thing is very complicated. At the end, when you come to the test, it is too complicated. So it is okay if code is being copied occasionally. I mean, in order to understand the entire flow of the test quite easily. So do, you do not want to debug the test. If you find yourself putting breakpoints and debugging the test, in some cases you need to do that. But if you do that all the time, every time a test fails, Something is wrong there. Your best buddies are the test name. The name should say something. Failure message that we would see out you add and the test code itself. Um, test according to the specification, not the actual implementation. And TDD helps here because you do not want the test to fail and then you see, oh, but the code is fine. It meets the requirements. It is just that the implementer decided to implement it differently than what it was before. But it is still according to the requirements. I mean, you do not want to rely on order of things if order is not required. You do not want to rely on anything which is not on the spec. And test public behavior and not your private behavior usually. In some cases, the private behavior is also in the requirements and then you still want maybe to test that. Bad excuses for not doing unit tests. 
We all have them. It's too difficult to test our code. So try to redesign the factory code. Try to decouple. Unit testing is hard if you have tight coupling between things. Uh, try TDD, which helps to ensure a cleaner design. Lack of time. But then bugs are time consuming if, if your management doesn't give, do not give you uh, time to test. You should persuade your manager that bugs are more costly than writing tests. Maybe, you know, add some nasty bug to, to do the work. Uh, prioritize. You should manage your time. See how you add tests. And um, in some cases, I know that people are writing a small main that checks the new feature and it works. Or oh, I wrote a test, but then the test is being gone. It is, it is not, you know, persisted. It is not in, in Git. It's not a unit test. It just, yeah, I wrote code, I, I checked, it works. It was not a manual check, I, I wrote code. That, so why the code is not part of your unit test? If something, you want regression, you want to check that again, not only once, put it as part of your unit test. By the way, there is another uh, excuse that I hear, but we use static code analysis. Well, it's a, it's a totally different domain. Static code analysis checks that your code works without internal bugs in the code itself, but it doesn't check that it works according to the requirements. It's totally a different thing. So yeah, we need testing. Don't use these excuses. Maybe come with other ones, but, but the better thing is to test. An unempirical observation. Uh, C++ projects tend to be less tested compared to projects in other languages. This is what I see. I don't know if you feel the same. I didn't do any empirical observation on that, but this is what I feel. And the reasons are that C++ is more complicated, a lot of dependencies, sometimes hardware specifics, legacy code that is hard to test. Where well, should we start if we have million lines of code and, and no tests? Uh, programmers overconfidence in their code. I think C++ uh, uh, programmers are a bit more confident. Maybe we should be less. And maybe some culture, I don't know. Uh, there was a very good talk uh, from CppCon last year on adding tests to a um, code base, legacy code base. Uh, so Brian Ruth, watch this talk. How to do that gradually. How to add value from the first test that you write in a big project that add maybe some tests but need more. So don't use the argument that, oh, it's too big already and we do not use unit tests. We have some component tests, we have some, no. You can add tests even to uh, an existing big project. Uh, let's do some theoretical class assignment. Are you ready for a class assignment? Can you open your notebooks? Okay, you can do it in your head. Uh, let's assume that we have a file name validator and the file name validator validates file names and the rules for, uh, valid file name is that it should be eight characters, then it might have a dot, then uh, eight or less, then it might have a suffix with three letters, uh, three characters or less, and the characters should be alphanumeric or a dash or underscore, so there are some rules, okay? Uh, can you think of a few tests? We want to test the file and validator. So usually, as programmers, the first thing that we think of is how to implement the file and validator. And this is not the question. The file and validator is there already. It was implemented. We need to test it, okay? Don't think about, oh, I would use regular expression. No, no, no. Don't think about implementing the unit. Think about, oh, we want to test it. So we should have a few a few good cases and a few bad cases, right? Okay, EpiPath and bad path. Okay, let's have them. So we may have um, a good file name with extension, a good file name without extension, a good file name with uh, minus and underscore, a bad file name, a bad null file name, maybe. Null is also a char star. Null might come in and so on and so forth, okay? 
Now, if we have all these it, 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 and they pass, they pass, I mean, those that should, the validator should fail, the test passes by checking that the validator, you know, fails, the, 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 the check fails in the validator. So then we know that, yeah, the validator works. And if something changes, we can run the, we would run the tests all the time. Okay. So this was a very simple test case, a very simple class exercise. We have many testing frameworks out there. Um, and, and by the way, this is one of the reasons for not testing or for not doing many things in life. Oh, there are too many options. Let's, let's pick the right option tomorrow or the day after because there are too many options. So I would tell you, roll the dice, pick one. I would pick Google Test because it is very popular, but you can pick one. I mean, picking one is always better than picking none in life, okay? This is a, a, you know, a message you can take to any domain. Uh, so a credit note, I was in Core C++. I am one of the organizers. There was a, a very good talk by Noam Weiss. Noam Weiss is a colleague, he's from Checkpoint. And I, I wouldn't say stole some of these slides because it is with his permission, but uh, uh, many of the slides that you would see here are from his presentation. Let's start, Google test, also known as G-Test. It is developed by Google, yeah, no surprise, it is called Google test. Um, it requires C++11, uh, next version would require C++14, we are there, most probably. These are the links, you would have the presentation and can go there. Google can also find Google test if you Google for it. Uh, so, test. A test has a name and it is associated with a test suite. Uh, test suites are a collection of tests. Tests include operations on tested code. So I want to test the code, so I do something with my code, and then I want to check the expected outcome with assertions or expectations. And if you have a test without any assertion or expectation, in most cases, it is a bad test. You're just doing something with your code without checking that something actually happened. Some case, in some cases, people do some test, they just want to, you know, for sanity, that nothing crashed. And I say, nothing crashed is nice. I mean, you know, that's the beginning. But maybe we can add some small expectation of we would expect the result to be, so I would expect an expectation in a test. Let's get started. And the best way to start coding is by coding. So. Oh, you've got a quick question from online. There's a question online. So let's go with the question. Uh, before the question, uh, just let me know if you see it or you need me to enlarge the font a bit. Um, no, don't need the slide. It's good, okay. Yeah, a question. A frequent excuse for not testing is a difficulty to mock dependencies, such as file system, user interface, et cetera. The language does not make it easy. Are there any language enhancements in consideration that would support testing of C++ code natively without having to use gmock, gtest? So the question was on gmock, which we would cover later in this talk. I would answer that shortly. Mocking is difficult. And mocking, in a way, requires us to use dependency injection in our design. In a way, we need to be able to replace a certain component with our mock. And in some cases, it is quite difficult. And then refactoring come to play. Oh, we might need to refactor our code. And this refactoring has its own value. It is the refactoring that, and, and, and projects do that, that creates de decoupling, that decouple are tightly coupled connections between components. So relying on an interface on, and not on a concrete implementation and uh, injecting the interface when we need it and not creating it ourselves, this is something that has value by itself and yeah, it would assist the test. Uh, but uh, um, I do agree that it is uh, an issue. It is an issue not only in C++, in other languages as well. It is a design issue. In C++ maybe a bit more because we do not have reflection. But 
It is doable to design the code so we would be able to mock, and we would talk about mocking later on. Let's start with a very simple example. So um, I'm in Compiler Explorer, and in order to use GTest in Compiler Explorer, I added a library. You see the green book, uh, I mean the book in the green uh, uh, frame there? So in Compiler Explorer, you can check, you can uh, ask to add uh, certain libraries. So I added here um, GTest. And now I can include gtest, gtest h. And I have tests here. So I have a few tests. And at the end, I have a main. Uh, usually, you do not create the main. gtest itself li is linked with its own main that runs your tests. But here, I'm in a single file. So in the main, I just call uh, run all tests. Um, so let's take a look at the test. And th there is a very nice thing here in uh, Compiler Explorer that the test that fails are in red. You can see, oh, this test failed. And on the other side, you can see the uh, output. You can see the output, and you can see this is the same output that you would see in the console, or a very similar in your ID. So we had here uh, three tests, I think, uh, and one failed. The one that failed, uh, oh, expect equal. Zero doesn't equal one. Yeah, that's right. So we have here expect ik, which is expect equal. And then we have a value and another value. And then we have um, like printing of the message. Oh, if this fails, this is the message that I want to convey. So in this case, the message is zero, one, zero, one. This is the message is, that is printed here because of the failure. How can we make it not fail? Maybe we can change it to one here. Then it should not fail, I guess. Uh, then we have something with A and three. A is two. Okay, by the way, the fact that the, the test fails is a good thing because in some cases I was sitting with a programmer who is trying to find a bug, but all the tests are, are working and, and pass. There is a bug, somebody reported a bug, but the test passes, okay? And then we take a look at the, at the test and we see that the test would always pass. You know, you, you can write tests that seems reasonable, seems to test something, but it is written in a way that, oh, you know what? I think it would always pass because something is not, is broken in the test itself. So how can you know that the test is good? You want to change the code in a way to break the code and see that the test actually, you know, finds the, the, the problem, the bug. Or the other way, change the test and see that it fails. So here, uh, let's change A to three and let's make it pass. Uh, here, A is four, and one plus one is not four, then let's change it to one plus, plus three. And here we have something with a string. Uh, we have an empty string, and we want to compare it to uh, empty char star, and uh, since equality between string and char star is being uh, implemented in the language, we can just, eventually, it calls equality. So I think we have all uh, test passes now, yeah. Okay, so let's take a look. A test has a test suite uh, uh, name, the name of the test itself. Um, hmm, something is not so good here because uh, I gave the same name twice. Let's change that. Okay, uh, it would just report the same name twice, which is not so good. Oh, uh, it is not the same name, sorry. It's the same name, but in different suite. So, suite. so it's okay. Or I can change the name. So we add here uh, three tests. These were very, very simple. Let's go back to the presentation. Um, again, if anybody has a question, can shout it or can send it online and then we would hear it from the volunteer over there. A question? No. Okay. Um, we also have microphones if people want to stop. Yeah, if somebody wants to come to the microphone, but then maybe you want, until you come to the microphone, I'm in the next slide. Uh, exceptions, uh, uh, sorry, assertions with expect. So we have expect equal, expect true. E expect true is quite, you know, primitive. You're just expecting, and be, in, in, inside, inside you just put your uh, uh, statement, the, the thing that you want to check. Uh, and why expect equal is better, because you get a better a verbose, a better um, message if it fails. We saw the message. I was expecting this and I got that. Now, expect true would just say that this, uh, you know, uh, statement failed. Uh, expect not equal, less than, floating equal. 
in which you can add the delta for the um, comparison. Expect throw, I'm expecting something to be thrown. Expect death, I'm expecting this operation to uh, make the program crash. And the program would not crash. It, the test would just check that, the program would try to crash, and the test would continue, saying, oh, it's good, you crashed, we expect you to crash. Okay, there are also asserts. What is the difference between expect and assert? Expect is the uh, soft failure. If expect fails, you continue in the same test to the next one. If assert fails, the, f the test fails and you do not continue to the next one. Usually you would use assert if, if a certain check fails, there isn't any logical reason to continue because the entire thing is wrong. And in many cases, you want to continue because maybe something is wrong, but maybe you can have more information with the underlying, with the next checks, and in which case you would use expect. Um, assert hides a return statement inside, so if you are using assert, you cannot do that, I think, in constructor because you cannot have a return in constructor, I think. Uh, there are some differences. If you want to read about the differences more, there is a Stack Overflow post on that. Uh, beware of C-strings. The first one is not good. If we could uh, returns a char star, uh, comparing char star to a char star is not the best thing because inside it would use equality, like the equal sign, equal, equal, and you want to compare either the char star to a string, the next one is fine, or to use str equal, string equal, or maybe you want to uh, check equality ignoring case. So we can use str case uh, insensitive. Okay, this was for strings. Uh, expectations on custom types. Suppose that I want to expect a point to be equal to another point, then most probably I need point to implement equality. Once you implement equality or fine, let's do that. So this is the example with point. Let's see that we get the point. So uh, we have a point, uh, just for simplicity, it is a struct, okay? And the code does, doesn't compile. Why the code doesn't compile? Any idea? Can you, can you tell me what is the problem here? I cannot expect equal at line 21 because because I don't have equality for point. Wait, what about line tw uh, 10? Oh, it is being shut off. Now it is open. Okay, now I do have equality for point and code compiles, but fails. Why does it fail? Because A and B are not the same point. Okay, let's see the message. The message says that A, which is eight byte object of blah, blah, is not the same as blah, blah. Uh, which is not so informative. I would expect something which would give me some more information. So let's do that. Okay, let's have a extractor, a printer for point, and then we would see that the information is much more informative, much more useful. Yeah, x1, y0 is not the same as x0, y1. And, and the red ear means that the, the test failed. Yeah, it failed. That's good. Okay, so we had here uh, custom type. Yeah, we can check on custom types. Matchers and expect that. In some cases, we could use expect true and, and put some statement, some check inside, but we want a better explanation if it fails. So we are using a matcher. Um, Gtest itself comes with a few matchers. We can create our own matchers. Let's take a look at a, an example. Okay, so in this case, in this example, we have a uh, tuple. And in the tuple, we have an int and a string. And we want to make sure the, um, that, that in our tuple, okay, there are fields. There are fields in the tuple. Um, and we want the, that, uh, that we would have two fields here. And the first one would be greater or equal to zero. And the second one would, uh, would have a substring hello. And the test passes here because the first one is seven and the other one is low. Let's delete the O from the low. L. And let's give it some time to compile. And L is not a low. 
and it fails because uh, value of type might apple expected as field zero that is greater than zero, and as field one that has substring hello. Look how smart it is. I didn't write it. Actual was seven and hello world was field one doesn't match. Yeah, I think it's quite inform informative. Now, if I would just, you know, check it with code, first I have to write the code, and second, I would just get a message that says, you just failed. Or I have to, you know, create my message myself. So let's bring it back. And this was a matcher. So we expect that. And here, there are all certain matchers like fields R. And fields R is relevant for a specific thing. You, can, uh, uh, you should go to a field by index or by name. You can go to a property, which means I'm calling, I'm calling a getter. So you can check many things and, and use matchers. This was just an example. Um, there was a question there, I think. Let's see if it is still relevant. Y yeah, this is actually going back a little bit. Does unit testing ever apply when some input is provided via the UI of an application? So the question is uh, whether we can uh, have interaction with UI. Usually we would not want to, but we can have interaction with files. So we can have a file that we can read during the unit test, which is reasonable, which makes sense if we want to have a lot of information that we get from outside. Um, if it is big, an image, a wave sound file, et cetera, some data. Uh, fixtures. We want to have a test suite, suite uh, with more information, with something that would happen uh, when we begin the test and when we end. We want to repeat things between, uh, uh, for all tests. So we want to reuse code across tests of the same suite. Uh, let's take a look at, at the code and see how we do that. Okay, so here we have a demo fixture which just inherits from testing test. And inside we have things that we could use, we would use in all tests. Uh, now our tests are not called test, but test F. F comes for fixture, and the fixture is this demo fixture, and we should use the same name. So we say, okay, we rely on demo fixture. Now the Fixture is now the test suite. It, it goes together, okay? So we just move from, okay, I'm giving you a name. Okay, I'm giving you a name, which is the fixture, and it comes together. In some cases, you want to use the same fixture for different test suites, and then you would use inheritance. You would use a base fixture, and then the different suites would inherit and use the derived fixture. But we would not do that here, so here, uh, we want to ask things about i. Now, i is 17, okay? Do something increases i, but in the next test, i would be 17 again because the fixture is being initiated for each test again and again. So you finish the test, you continue to the next one, and the fixture is being created again. Constructor, a setup function, a teardown function at the end, and a destructor. Let's talk a bit about the fixtures. So the stages are, there is a static setup test suite function, which takes care of operations that you want to do before all tests. This is being done once for all tests. And then for each test, you would have the fixture default constructor once and uh, before the test, setup function, if you created the setup function, and then the test body, the two down function of the fixture, the destructor, and after all tests of this fixture, the static two down test suite function. If you ask yourself, what is the difference between the constructor and the setup? Should I use the initialization before a test in the constructor or in the setup? There are some links there, you should go there. There are some differences and some recommendations of whether to use the constructor or the setup function. By the way, for example, if the till down or, or the end of the test, the thing that you want to do when the test ends, like closing a file, closing something, might throw an exception, it might be, oh, you can just, you know, catch the exception, but it might be that you want to put it not in the destructor. Let's talk about parameterized test. Uh, suppose that I have a test and I want to run it 
a few times with different parameters. Okay, so in this case, I'm using a foo test class, which inherits from test with params, test with param. And I'm giving it a template argument, a template parameter uh, saying that uh, the param would be a tuple of three ints. This is what I want in this test. Instead of a tuple of three ints, it could be a char, it could be a string, it could be a, a class of your type. And then in the test, test itself, I'm using foo test as a fixture. And this is the name of the test. It's not so, such a good name because I'm using here also a function by this name, but it works. I could use, I could change it to add underscore test, which might be better, but it, it works. Um, and here, I just get the parameters that I would show you in a moment where I create them, okay? And I just uh, structure bind them back to ABC and check that add of AB equals C. And it, equal, it is equal because one plus two is three, two plus two is four. And I put these in an instantiate test suite P, P for parameters. I call the data simple numbers. This is the foot test. Uh, these are the values. And, and uh, this one would call the test with the values. Now I want to call the test again, but with other values. So I have another one for the same test, same test, but with a different name. Let's say that for the negative number, something is broken, okay? Negative number, sorry. Uh, in this case, something is broken in the test, but it might be that something was broken in the function itself. So when it would finish here compiling, we would see that expected equality of these values failed, and it failed on the negative numbers case. Because I had a parameterized for negative numbers. So parameterized is helping us when we want to check the same test with different kind, different list of possible arguments. Okay, mocking. Why? Because we want to test A without relying on a specific behavior of B. B is another component. It's for the other team. They write a lot of bugs. If I would check with them, it would not work. Or maybe they didn't finish yet, the B. So I want to replace B with a mock of B. And I know how the mock of B would, uh, um, would work, would be A, because I'm writing the mock. So I just want to check A. Uh, beware of mocking uh, the SUT itself. In some cases, you come to a test and you see, I think that you are testing the mock. I don't see any actual code that you are running. So don't do that. Don't test a mock. Test your code, which is relying on a mock. So this is what you want to do. Testing your actual code, which relay, relies on a mock. Uh, the solution is to create a simplify, simpli, simplified object that mocks the real behavior. Let's take a look at an example. Okay, so in this example, we have the red here means that something fails. Uh, my mock. My mock, in, in this case, does not inherit from anything. It could inherit and then it gets some functions from another class, but here, I just want two functions, that's all. I'm saying, okay, I have two functions. Um, one is called foo, the other one is called bar. Foo returns int, doesn't get any arguments. Bar gets int, it is const, and it uh, returns int. And then inside uh, my um, here, I have a, a fixture that I would be using. I'm saying that I'm expecting in each test, because it's in the fixture here, all tests should expect the mock to call once, um, to call once the foo function and expect the return value to be six, and again to call uh, foo and expect the value to be nine. And let's take a look to see if it happens. So um, why it does not happen? Foo should return something, right? In order for foo to return something, I saying here, sorry, saying it again. Uh, I'm expecting a call to foo. On the first call, I'm saying that I would return six. I would return six. And on the second call, I would return nine. This is the mock behavior. And now, the problem is that here, I'm calling it only once, where I expected uh, two calls. This one is fine. This one is not, and this one is not as well, because um, I'm calling it three times. So let's put these, let's put this one in a comment. 
Let's put the entire test here in a comment. And now we have two tests. One is expecting six and nine. The other is expecting six and nine. And let's see if things would work. And our mock says that I'm expecting a call to foo. On the first call, I would return six. On the second call, I would return nine, which is what I expect here. And I do call foo twice, exactly. Compile Explorer, kill process because it was too, took too much time. Let's do it again. If not, I will leave it to you. Um, eventually, what we want is to have the two. Um, okay, we have two uh, tests passing because in two tests, we actually call it twice. Uh, if we would expect something else, it would fail. Uh, because it returns nine, because the mock says that we are going to return nine. Now, this is not a real test. I mean, I'm just having the scene off. I'm not testing any actual code. I'm just playing with the mock here. But usually you would call your code, which in its turn should call the mock, and you should inject the mock to your code, and usually it is being done with an interface. This is not a real test. It's just a play with mocking. Okay, so we just saw how you can mock something and then you should provide the mock to your actual code. So your actual code will use the mock instead of the component that is not ready or buggy. Uh, uninteresting call, suppose that I call something which is not expected. So the default is nagging. The default is saying that it would warn but not fail the test. It would say, oh, um, I saw that the mock had a call to something which you did not say that you are expecting. I don't like it. Usually I want a test to be binary, fail or pass. I don't want any warnings. So I want to go with the other two, one of the other two, either a nice mock or a strict mock. A nice mock says, if you're calling something and you didn't say that you are expect expecting that, this is fine, I do not fail, no warning. Strict mock, I would fail if you are calling something which was not expected. There is an example here that I would not go through due to lack of time. Actions. You can, in your mock, create actions, like saying, okay, and I want the mock to call an actual function. Or I want to mock to return. We just did that. Or I want the mock to return the value of a pointer. Now, let's talk about returning the value of a pointer. Usually, if I want the mock to return a value of a pointer, I could just use indirect. Take the pointer, put a star, and just return that. But it doesn't work. Let's see why. And this is the reason there is a return point T. Okay, let's take a look. Okay, so in our case, we have here a mock that has a function get value, and get value should return an int. Okay, now there is a, this is a test. I call it bad one because it's a bad test. Something is broken here. Um, and again, it's not a real test. We are not testing any actual code. We are playing with mocks. In a real scenario, the mock would be injected into the real code in a way, and then we would test the code, and the code would use the mock, and we would expect the mock to behave in a certain way. Here, I'm putting zero in X, I'm expecting a call to foo, and I'm saying that it, would, it will repeatedly return X. And then I'm putting 42 in X. Now, X is now 42. But the, the problem is that when X was taken here, it was zero. So when I expect 42, it is not. It did not take the uh, actual value that I put here. Okay, let's try something else. Maybe I would use to ref. No, same problem. Okay, so let's try something else. I would repeatedly say that if you call, call get value, I would return the actual value that inside x. Okay, now you are getting the actual value. I, I mean, you are asking to get it lazily. I want to get the value fixed when you need it. And it is usual, uh, um, it is used also when you have a proxy class. We have something that, I don't want to get the value yet, only when the test would ask for that, because something would change in the meantime, or uh, I want the call to be done only when you actually need it, and not here, and this one helps. I'm giving the pointer, and then the call itself would be in the test itself when I call get value. So this is the return point T. I want to get the value inside and not the value that you get initially. Um, distinguishing calls. 
um, I can, in a way, distinguish the call and ask that I expect the call to a function on the mock, but I expect the call to be done with certain arguments. Or I expect it to be called with the arguments of this and that. Uh, on foo, we couldn't do that because foo was void. Foo didn't get any arguments, but we can do that on the bar. If you remember, bar did get arguments. So uh, let's take a look. Okay, so we have here uh, mock with foo and bar. And here we say, okay, we expect a call to bar, but we expect a call to bar, um, expect call to bar with one, and then we would uh, return two. But if you call it with two, we would return five. And here we call it with one, and we expect two, which is fine, one with two, two with five, one with two, two with five, so what's the problem? Oh, the problem is here, I think. Now, it shows here the problem on, on another place because it failed there, but I think that the problem is that we called it with three, and we do not have any, any expectation for what would happen if you call bar with three. Oh, I didn't say anything. So maybe we can add that. Let's add that three should return zero. Okay, let's do that. So if you call bar with zero, uh, three, so it was three, then I should return zero. Let's see what would happen. Uh, this is uh, in order for this test to, f to pass. Um, and, and, let's wait for compilation. It still thinks about that. Right, we have one for two, and two for five, should work. Yeah, we have three tests that pass. Okay, this was uh, expecting a certain argument and uh, relying on the argument for what we should return. Uh, we can use matchers also on the arguments. We can say, okay, I'm not expecting uh, specifically one. For any number between one and 10, I would return that. For any number between 11 and uh, tw 20, I would return that. So we can put matchers on the argument that we are expecting on the mock. Um, setting expectations. Actions on the same expectation must happen in the order they appear. So if you expect something and then expect something else, this would be the order that the test would check it. If it is on other um, different expectations, uh, on other uh, mocks, then it's fine. The order doesn't really matter. Um, there are two possible options to set expectations right before your operation or to set all expectations up front. Pick one. I usually prefer to set expectations just before I do something because then I can you know, follow the flow. I can understand, okay, I w in a moment I would do something and, and this something should call the mock and I expect the mock to do something. And then I expect something else down below. Some others prefer to set all expectations at the beginning, but do not mix, because when you mix, it's very hard to follow. Toward summarizing, best practices, measure your code coverage, but remember that it is not the best measurement. 100% coverage is not actually 100% because you have branches, you have loops. Uh, you got into the loop, but you didn't check the loop for zero times, you didn't check the loop for, uh, maybe for zero it is in coverage, but uh, you measured for three, not for four, et cetera. Uh, tools like G-Cove. Found a bug. If you found a bug, create a test that reproduces the bug. Create a test. Then the bug would not come again. And if it would come, you would catch it. Perform code review on your tests. Prefer running unit tests with minus O0 because otherwise inlining and other stuff interferes in a way in the logic. Now, it's true that production code should be in system test, tested with the same optimization flag as you are using in production. But my recommendation is for unit test, use minus O0. It would allow better uh, analysis, better understanding of the code. Zero tolerance for bad and failed tests. If you have a test that, oh, this one fails, uh, it's okay, nobody cares, no, just remove it or fix it. Remember, tests are a tool, not a goal by itself, so in some cases you just have to get tests because it is a management decision to have tests and you write bad tests. Don't, you know, good coverage with bad tests is horrible. You think you're fine, but you're not. Better to have less coverage, but with proper testing. Naive tests are just 
noise, like testing getters and setters, or testing some, you know, testing the mock. If you have plenty of tests and bugs are still coming, make sure you, uh, your tests are not focused on the naive parts, and make sure that the test may fail. I mean, change the code, check that the test can actually fail. A concluding example, I think that I still have time for a concluding example. So, uh, I'm leading a C++ game show. We had two episodes of, uh, uh, till now. Um, this is how it looks like. Uh, this is uh, me um, above there with uh, Daisy Ullman, uh, who was a co-host. And here we have Peter and Noam and John. We are participating, cont contesting on a challenge. This was the challenge. We wanted to implement a new iterator for vector, which is a bit more safe. In, in vector, the iterator is invalidated if you do pushback. And we wanted that if you do pushback and you use the iterator, you would get an exception. So the challenge was in 30 minutes, to create the new iterator for vector, okay? And the nice thing was that Noam Weiss, Noam Weiss, the, the same Noam that uh, I stole the slides from, um, he created a solution with testing. So let's take a look at these tests. He was using gtest. He did that in 30 minutes, okay? The, the solution itself is, is quite short, okay? But the testing part is what interests us here. Okay, so we have above a safe vector. We, we, they, they could inherit from vector, they could change vector. The idea was just to come with an approach. An approach for iterator that if is invalidated, if it is being invalidated, would throw an exception if you are trying to use it. Okay, this was the idea. And here there is an iterator, I would not go through the code itself, but I want to go through the test. So we have here in the test, we check, we do things with a ve vector, and then we expect equal on something here. We expect that the value uh, that comes from the vector uh, would you know, correlate with the numbers that we put inside. Now we want to check something on the iterator. So we expect throw. Oh, the idea was that something will throw an exception. Let's check that it actually throws an exception. Except throw, okay. And we expect runtime error because this is what the requirement said or this is what we know that we are going to throw. Uh, and after this was being thrown, we want to check that the begin doesn't equal, is not equal, uh, uh, does not equal end. Uh, and we can also push back one and then check that the first iterator is pointing to one, is holding one. Yeah, this is a very nice unit test. So, if you want to come to a C++ game show, we are working on the next one, on episode three, come to me and tell me that you are brave enough to implement something in 30 minutes, it's fun. You would enjoy it, okay? Um, and you could add testing. These are the resources for this talk. These are the additional resources. There are many, many uh, unit test uh, talks in CPPCon and elsewhere. I watched most of them just to get prepared, but there, there is much more information than, than what you got here because we are in back to basics. Okay, there are much more advanced stuff. And if you have any questions before we conclude, I got a sign there that we should conclude, but I think that we can take a question. Oh, there is an online question. question. Um, can we test using constrained random inputs? That is the same technique as used by hardware verification programmers. So the, the question is regarding uh, um, random input. Um, well, th there are um, methods for testing things with random input, and then uh, recording the result, checking the result, that the result was what we expected, and then creating a unit test from that. So this is something that I do occasionally. I mean, I do not use arbitrary or randomly numbers in the test itself. I do it before. I create random input, I run it, I know what should be the result, I check the result that it makes sense, logically, and then I have a unit test. So, uh, and it, it can be used with parameterized testing. It's not the exact same, it's not a, um, an answer to the question. It's like, you know, I'm getting around, but this is something that I do, but uh, I guess that in a way, there is a possibility to do random things in the test itself. If there is any other question, yeah, please. Um. Is, do you know of any good tools for running gtest in parallel? I saw some that seem less well maintained. 
there is some issues with uh, thread safety in G-Test, uh, so I think that before you rush to it, there is a need to read what can be done and what not. Um, so we can take it offline and, and discuss. Uh, the idea is that things should, in the test, should not work in parallel, but it can be done under certain restrictions. Please. Yeah, thank you for the talk. A few years ago, I tried, I, I went out looking for a tool to mock a hardware input to record uh, some device that connected through USB that I could uh, replicate in tests. I couldn't find any. I thought I'd pick your mind. Maybe you have an experience with something like that? So uh, eventually what we try here in this talk is to mock things that the code itself is using. So the fact that there is some hardware underneath, we are talking about the API. So once I have the API, I can mock anything. I can say, OK, the API should return some stream. OK, if I can create the stream for a file, I can do that. So the thing that, the, the idea that something comes from an hardware, from hardware, should not interfere or you know, impact the way we implement the mock. Creating the information, creating the data is, I guess, I guess, the problematic part. So we can discuss that and think together offline. So creating the data is something which is, of course, one of the challenges. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, all. I'm here for additional discussion if anybody wants. <laughs>